When one of the great American Catholic short story writers of the 20th century, Flannery O'Connor, passed away in 1964, at the age of 39, she left behind an unfinished work, a novel that would have been her third. Deemed unpublishable, it remained in the O'Connor archive until now. My next guest took on the task of editing the unfinished manuscript. To tell us all about it, I'm joined by the Fletcher Jones Endowed Chair of the Great Books at Pepperdine University. She's also the author of Flannery O'Connor's Why Do the Heathen Rage? A behind-the-scenes look at a work in progress. Please welcome back to the program Jessica Hooten Wilson. Whew, I know that's a long intro. Look, <laughs> you know, as you know, Jessica, I'm a huge O'Connor fan. But before we get to your version of Why Do the Heathen Rage, uh, I want to revisit something we spoke about when you were last here. We talked about the role of suffering in the mm. search for God, and Flannery O'Connor struggled with lupus her entire writing career, mm. and I think it bears repeating a quote of hers. She, she said this about suffering in the characters she created. It has always seemed necessary to me to throw the weight of circumstances against the characters I favor. Mm. The friends of God suffer. How does O'Connor's work utilize suffering to demonstrate its power and how it can draw one to God? I think it's important to distinguish between suffering that is being instrumentally used by God versus an idea that God himself is making his people suffer. There are things that make us suffer in the world, but we always want to distinguish that not it's not God doing it, right? It's the, the yeah. sinfulness of human beings. It's the fallenness of the state of the world. And Flannery saw that, and it was with her teeth bared, looking at suffering in the face and saying, okay, what does it mean to be refined by this suffering like it's a purgatorial fire? And so that's what you get to see in her work is that characters can either choose to see suffering is going to burn them up towards damnation or it's going to burn them towards purging and refining them. And, and I think that's what's, mm. what's beautiful about what happens in Flannery's stories. Well, and this brings us to your latest project, mm -hmm. uh, Flannery O'Connor's Why Do the Heathen Rage, this behind-the-scenes look at a work in progress. How were you chosen, or how did you choose yourself to complete, <laughs> uh, if you will, Flannery's unfinished novel? It's a little. And what were you dealing with in the archives? Sure, it's it's a little bit of both. And on that, I was excited to do it. Of course, I jumped at the opportunity. But Billy Sessions, who was the one who did her prayer journal several years ago, and he was able to mm -hmm. put that out, he was a friend of Flannery's. He was very well-versed in her archives. In 2009, we had dinner, and we discussed what was in her archives. And he said, if you love Dostoevsky, you're going to love Flannery's unfinished novel. It was the first I'd heard about it. So I headed straight to the archives. Mm. I started working on it. And when I showed Billy what I was working on, he said, you know what? You're the one to put this out. You're the one to finish it and brought it to the attention of the, of the estate. So we went from there, and it's been almost 15 years oh. trying to get this to put out wow. in the right way. Well, and, and the story is pure O'Connor. Yeah. But uh, one can see how there might have been some hesitation to publish this, given the story's central theme of race. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's set, of course, in the South. The main character is a young white intellectual, Walter Tillman, mm -hmm. who pretends to be black in his correspondence with a white woman, Una, who's a New York social justice activist. Tell us a bit about the plot and the other themes O'Connor wrote about this story. Sure. It is pure O'Connor, as you said. So the character of Walter should remind us so much of Flannery, who also had gone off to schooling, so to speak, in the North, and then returned to her Southern world. And her Southern world in the 1960s was a very segregated world. So it's the world that Walter Tillman, her character, lives in. And in this world, he is challenging the people around him by writing letters to them and pretending to be someone other than who he is. In this case, he puts on what I call epistolary blackface. So you're right, this would be a difficult thing to publish at this time. But what happens in the work is Flannery, in a sense, is challenging her own preconceptions, the problems she had in her own world about race and the things that she thought were problematic. Even in the 1960s, this is before Lyndon B. Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act. You have Flannery taking on this issue and, and wanting to understand, you know, how is everyone made in God's image? What does it look like to really love your neighbor? And it's through this character that she puts in this circumstance that she's really able to ask those questions. Mm. Now, since the work was unfinished and you had to pour through not only type pages of manuscript as well as O'Connor's handwritten notations, you had kind of a monumental task here organizing this thing. How did you decide to organize the material 
And what was your guiding principle as you made decisions about what to leave in or omit? It took a lot of different forms over the last decade or so trying to get this correct and having a lot of input from people. I would send drafts to others and get their feedback, O'Connor scholars, from novelists, from writers and memoirists, just what is the right way to tell this story? And I think the more that I involved other people in the conversation, I began to see that that's what was beautiful about this story. This story was a way of showing that a woman was in progress herself and that she was sharing her story with us and she was in a sense asking us to be a part of it. And as I went through the process in that way, I started forming a narrative that said, okay, what do we wonder? What do we hope for this work? When we read this, what are our responses? How does this put us into a community, I think, in the way that Flannery wanted her work to be part of the church and part of its activity? And so I hope that that was kind of my guidance as I went through. In what ways could I be faithful to her, but also draw people into her story? Why was the work left unfinished at the time? I mean, obviously she, she died, mm -hmm. but it wasn't only her passing that interrupted the publication here. Right. Well, many of her, her two novels took the longest. As you started the introduction, you said, mm -hmm. you know, she's a famous short story writer. That's what she was right. really good at. So I think part of it was a difficulty she always had in writing the longer genre. But also, of course, the mm -hmm. issues of race. She did not have black friends, and she's trying to write about a character who puts on blackface through the mail. She did not live in an integrated world, even though she said that that is something that, by principle, she desired. And so she had those hurdles to kind of overcome. And then lastly, it was her sickness. She fainted, you know, a year before she died in November of 1963 and was battling her sickness until her death. So it was also the sickness that kept her quite a bit from working on the story she wanted to tell. Uh, give me a sense about what the public can expect here mm -hmm. in uh, when they when they pick up Why Do the Heathen Rage? Is it complete? What is it? I know it's her last novel, mm -hmm. but what are you presenting them with, and how does it fit in with her other work? I think it's important to stress, and we tried to on the cover, that this is a work in progress. It's an unfinished mm -hmm. novel. I call it a literary excavation. It is a behind-the-scenes mm -hmm. look at the material. So the places uh -huh. that I found were that were compelling in her story, the scenes that the scenes that felt finished rather than the whole novel being finished. And I put those scenes into a context of what was Flannery reading at the time, what was she thinking about, what was going on in the news, who was around her, mm -hmm. and how can we read these stories and get to see the fuller picture and try to imagine what she would have done with the material later had she lived. I know when you study a work of an individual intently for a long period of time, I remember transcribing Mother Angelica's addresses and teachings, and, you know, you, you start to hear their voices in your sleep. You inevitably learn something you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. What surprised you mm. about O'Connor's work as you immersed yourself in it? Oh, that's a fantastic question. You know, I don't think I understood her as a stylist as well as I did later. Mm. Once I started realizing how closely she attended to every word, that in some pages she would cross out one word and then the next day return to it and then the next day cross it out. And she was regularly just looking word by word. And I would go back and read her other short stories that were published during her lifetime that she did revise. And I saw how carefully mm. she crafted every single word. And suddenly the sacramental world she was creating where each word meant more than just it's superficial or it's literal sense, but had a spiritual significance. I could read her mm -hmm. in a stronger way than I'd ever read her before. Hmm. How did how did her Catholic faith mm. manifest in this work? Did it show itself? Plainly absolutely, to you? absolutely. I think that is another attribute that we get to see in the story that's different than the works she had published before. Mm. Instead of startling mm. her character into a conversion, she said she wanted to be like Elijah hearing God's voice in a still small voice while he's in the cave. And so in a sense, we have Walter coming to God through a still small voice rather than a, a shocking drama or, you know, a stabbing by a gore by a bull or, you know, we don't have some of those like <laughs> violent moments. We instead get this yeah. still small voice that she was working on. Well, I, I can't wait to read the, this deep more deeply because while I appreciate the still small voice, I still like the two by four over the middle of the head <laughs> that Flannery O'Connor usually delivers to us. We will leave it there. Flannery O'Connor's Why Do the Heathen Rage? A behind the scenes look at a work in progress compiled and edited by Jessica Hooten. Wilson is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much.